For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Everybody, can we start off by just welcoming our other campus, Portage Campus. Let's put our hands together and welcome those who are over at Portage. We love you guys. Pastor Richard and Sarah, your little beautiful baby is so gorgeous. And uh, we're looking, Jane and I are looking forward to our grandson being born in January. And uh, Ashley's doing well, so we're going to be in the middle of seek. So Jane and I are going to be praying and fasting. But I just want to warn you, if in the middle of the fast my grandchild is born, I am eating pizza and celebrating. So you, you guys will just have to hold it down. But so good to be with everybody this morning. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. This is part 6 of our series entitled 316. And while you're turning there, we just want to uh, share with you a celebration point, uh, something really cool that has happened uh, in the last couple days. Our very own Pastor Caleb Culver and Pastor Corey Asbury just received word that they have been nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Gospel Song of the Year. So it's awesome. So all you need in life is to just be nominated for a Grammy, uh, but it'd be even better to, to win one for best gospel song. The song Reckless Love is just, uh, it's impacting so many people's lives, but we just honor them and what God is doing from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Isn't that amazing? Kalamazoo's on the map, baby. We've been nominated. So, uh, John chapter 3, this is part 6 of our series 316, and today we're going to be talking about Whoever believes, those two words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of you have it memorized already? You've got John 3, 16 memorized. Let's say it all together one more time. They put it up on the screens, both campuses. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Today we're talking about whoever believes. I actually grew up memorizing the King James and New King James Bible. So all my Bible memorization is New King James. And the New King James, when it translates this verse, uses the word whosoever, not whoever. Whoever's what the English Standard Version, which this is what I typically study and, and preach out of. But whenever I read John 3, 16, my old New King James kicks in, and I love the flow of that word, whosoever. Everybody say, whosoever. whosoever. See, it sounds better than whoever, but they're both kind of the same, so it's whatever. <laughs> it's whosoever, whoever, but it's interesting that when we use the word whoever, it's typically in the context of just kind of uh, whatever, I mean, just whoever, that's fine, whatever. But when God uses that word, as he does in John three sixteen, whoever believes shall be saved, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, he's using it in the context of an open door of opportunity that includes everybody. See, the reality is, in our world, we typically attribute great things, good luck, significant opportunities, awards, prizes, celebrity status, being well known to somebodies, people that are somebody. You mentioned names, oh, uh, that's somebody. Well, of course, they had that, you know, that, that open door of opportunity because they're a somebody and you have to know somebody. But when it comes to how God relates to us and the offer of salvation, the gift of giving his son, Jesus Christ. He didn't give his son, Jesus, for somebody's. He gave him for whoever's. Whoever's. And you know, you're a whoever. I'm a whoever. I'm not a who living in Whoville, but I am a whoever. You are a whosoever. 
And the two key words there that are so significant are whosoever believes. Number one, if you're a whoever, that means you qualify for the Christmas gift from heaven, which is God's son, Jesus, which produces salvation and grants you eternal life. But the key is the whoever only works when you do the second part of that phrase, which is to believe. It's to believe. It's important that we believe, not just that we recognize that in this world, I'm maybe not a somebody, but I'm definitely a whoever, and I'm qualified for salvation because as Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's me. I'm an everyone. I'm an anyone. God is able to take whoever, wherever, who's done whatever, and give you life forever. He's just able to do that. So the good news of the gospel is that if you've ever felt obscure, if you've ever felt like you weren't significant, if you've ever felt broken, if you've ever felt like good things didn't always happen to you, that something was wrong on the inside of you, but you didn't know how to fix it. I've got good news for you. That means that you are a whoever. And God doesn't overlook whoever's. God sends a savior to redeem whoever's. And that's you today, that's me. If we will only believe. You see, in the world, it's good performance actually qualifies us for good things. But actually, it's the fact that we can't perform good enough that actually qualifies us for God's righteousness, for God's salvation. It's the very fact that you are broken, that you don't have it all together, that makes you a whoever, that's actually the reason why God sent Jesus. You are the one Jesus came for. Jesus didn't come for the ones who are well. He said the physician comes for the one who's sick. He didn't come for the one who had it all together. He came for the one whose life is a mess. He didn't come for the one that is celebrated in tabloids and all over celebrity magazines. He came for the one that is hidden, the one that was the one lamb that he left the 99 to come in pursuit of. There's good news in being a whoever. And I know that in my life, I've been a whoever. That anything that, that is good that has happened in my life has not been because I somehow qualified myself or deserved it. Anything that is good that has happened in my life is the result of God's grace because he saw me when nobody else saw me. When I was just a whoever, he was willing to send Jesus. Do you know that Jesus had all kinds of whoever's that approached him? in his ministry. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, you see a variety of people who were drawn to Jesus, who were whoever's, just like you and I are whoever's to this day. You think about the list of people that, that approached Jesus. Jesus had the hopeless that approached him. People that were at the end who had no hope, who thought everything was lost. Think about the leper, the man who approached Jesus in Matthew chapter eight who had leprosy. And you, you might think to yourself, well, why would a leper be hopeless? We need to realize that for a leper in Jesus' day, when you were diagnosed with leprosy, there was no cure for that, and it meant that you had to leave your family, you had to leave your children, you had to leave your job, you had to leave your community, and you had to go live by yourself out in the wilderness. And if anybody ever came across you, you had to yell out long before they ever got to you, unclean, unclean, because you were ceremonially unclean. But when this man who had leprosy, who had lost all hope, approached Jesus, he didn't leave the same way that he came. He came to Jesus unclean, but he encountered Jesus, he believed Jesus, and he was made clean. He was a, a hopeless man who found hope in the Son of God. Jesus had religious experts that came to him. We know that, right? I mean, Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and theologians, and they came to Jesus for a lot of different reasons. Some came out of curiosity. They were whoever's that came curious. But there were some of them that came because they were trying to catch Jesus, trying to debate with Jesus, trying to prove that he wasn't the Messiah. They came with wrong motives, and they came with contempt in their heart for Jesus, and they wanted to debate theology. You know, debating doctrine and theology is fun at times, but don't debate theology with God. How many know that's a losing battle? Well, you know, the Bible says, and God says, I know what the Bible says. I wrote it. Thank you very much. 
Debate with the Jehovah's Witness who comes to the door or the Mormon who's walking around with a badge and a 17-year-old elder. And uh, debate with them or debate with the, the philosophical person who has a lot of questions. You can debate, that's fine. But you are going to lose the battle every single time when you debate with the living word of God. And every time that they came with the wrong motives to approach Jesus, they all walked away with their tail tucked between their legs because Jesus put them in their place. Jesus said, I'll answer you when you answer me. And it's like, ah, I'm out. But do you know that Nicodemus was one of the religious leaders? And that's where we find in John chapter three, he came to Jesus in the middle of the night asking questions because he came with a hungry heart. He came with a desire to be right with God. What's interesting is that the religious leaders who approached Jesus, the legalistic, the the self-righteous, they approached Jesus. They didn't know it, but they were one of the whoever's that Jesus came to save. But you know, God can't save that which doesn't know it's lost. Arthur Wallace says, you can't offer a pardon to a man who's never been convicted of a crime. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought they were righteous. And so when you approach, if, if re, a religious mindset and an attitude towards who Jesus is, if we approach Jesus with a religious mindset, we're approaching him with our own self-righteousness. If you don't leave your self-righteousness at the feet of Jesus, then you walk away with your own filthy rags. But what salvation is, and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were two of the religious leaders and many of the priests and many of the scribes when they came to Jesus for a whosoever in need of Savior. And they left their self-righteousness at Jesus' feet. So the list goes on. Jesus had the hopeless, <coughs> excuse me. He had the religious experts. Jesus had sexually broken people that approached him. They were whoever's. Jesus had the rich young ruler approach him. Remember that story? where Jesus has a man who the gospels described as rich, young, and a ruler. He had the three things the world tells us is the key to success. He had money, youth, and influence. Rich, young ruler. And he came to Jesus with his pedigree, and he says, I've been good, I went to Sunday school, and I've kept all the laws of God. Am I saved? And Jesus said, you lack one thing. Give everything away and come follow me because your problem isn't what you've done. Your problem is that you find your identity in those things and you think you're good enough by yourself. So I want you to empty everything that you believe is a description or a badge that defines your own identity. I want you to give it all away and I want you to come follow me and then you'll be made right with God. So he had the rich who came to him. He had criminals. Remember the thief on the cross who approached him. He had children who came to him and he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Jesus had tax collectors, he had pagan uh, soldiers, and he had demoniacs who approached him. And you know what all of them had in common? Whether they were the Pharisee or the demoniac from Gadarenes or whether they were the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well who had been married five times, divorced five times, and was living with a guy. They all had one thing in common. They were all whosoever's. They were all in the same classification that whoever believes in him, in Jesus, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. They all, listen, they all approached Jesus as a whosoever who had the same common issue. They all had sin problems. They all had problems that they could not fix themselves. They had sin problems. Every one of us in this room have sin problems. How many in this room, just by a show of hands, have ever been tempted to do anything wrong? If you didn't raise your hand, you just sinned your first time. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the club of the messed up. I've heard it said, if you're breathing, you have issues. We all do. We all, that's what makes us a whosoever. You see, religion tells us that if you want to be made right with God, you have to build a ladder high enough climb all the rungs, and eventually you'll be face-to-face -face with God. You can make your way to heaven. But Christianity is different. Jesus is different than religion because what the, the gospel is, the story that we find in John 3, 16, tells us that God knew that we could never save ourselves. And so instead, he built a ladder, but he climbed down it, and he came to us. And he died on the cross in our place 
took our penalty so that we could take his life. And that we could have the same life that he had always had, the same relationship that he had always had, that he had always had with God the Father. You see, sin is powerful. Temptation is powerful. We've all experienced temptation. We've all sinned. I know sometimes we come to church and we think, wow, my problems are much worse than everybody else's. Maybe, maybe I'm not worthy to be in church. Can I just tell you, you have no idea the things that other people are facing. Sin is an equal opportunity destroyer. It's a cancer that we're all contaminated with. It doesn't matter whether you're sitting out there or whether you're up on the stage. We all struggle. We all are whosoever. We all need God's grace. But the good news this morning is this, that sin is not the most powerful force in the universe. Even though it lies to us and it tells us that it's stronger, that it's always going to dominate us, that this is how things are always going to be, that you can never be free, that this is just who you are, that there's never going to be any chance of change or transformation in your life. Sin is loud and obnoxious, but it's not the most powerful force in the universe. The most powerful force in the universe is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. For the Jew first and then unto the Greek. I mean, it says, it is the power of God to save us. Sin is powerful, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's grace, is so much more powerful. You know, the word gospel actually means good news. You can find the entirety of the gospel in John 3, 16. God, love, gave, whosoever believes, eternal life, perish. There's the gospel. It's a narrative, it's a story that when we recognize our part in the story as a whosoever, it positions us for salvation. We say, you know what, I need a savior, God. I need you to save me, forgive me, I can't save myself. And God says, I've already done it. When I sent Jesus, he was the way, he was the truth, and he was the life. But, you know, in our world today, there are a lot of false gospels, a lot of false narratives, stories that we live under and attach our lives to. And here's what I've come to find out. Whatever gospel, and you might not call it a gospel, and let me tell you, in our culture today, what we call it is my truth. So, well, I'm just kind of living my truth, and your truth is different from my truth. If that's your truth, you go ahead and live your truth, but this is my truth. What they're really saying is that there are multiple different truths. What we're saying is that I've got my gospel that I've identified as the truth for me, and I'm living out the implications of that gospel, that good news. Let me give you a few of the gospels that are permeating and pervasive in our culture today. There is, number one, there is the gospel of humanism. Here's what humanism says. It's, it's the gospel of human. It doesn't, you're not gonna find a book that says the gospel of humanism, but it's the truth that a lot of people are living out of. The gospel of humanism says this. Everything in this world came from nothing and by random chance, and you are at the center of your own universe. Save yourself from the concept of sin, lack of significance, or the need of salvation, and then you'll be happy. So there are a lot of people, atheists, agnostics, skeptics, who say, you know what, Uh, I don't think any, there's any reason, there's any purpose for life, this is all that there is, and I'm at the center of my own universe, so whatever, I've, uh, I gotta get rid of all this religious legends and mythologies, if I could just get rid of that, then I would just be happy, and and that would be, that would be the best life. And there are, are people that live under that truth, that gospel. Then there's the gospel of hedonism. And the gospel of hedonism says that salvation is actually found in doing whatever feels good to you. Extinguish your shame and your sense of right and wrong and extinguish your own conscience and just live for today. Hey, if it feels good, do it. If it makes you happy, that's cool. You know what? That's great if there's not a God who actually is the creator and we are part of his creation. And as being creator, he actually put into place natural and spiritual laws by which everything is designed to flourish and live, of which we as part of his creation will one day give an account for the lives we lived in the middle of this world. If that's not true, then yeah, it's like live it up, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. Tomorrow we die. Might as well have fun. 
He who wins with the most toys still dies. <laughs> but there are a lot of people that live their lives out of this truth. And then the last one is more of a spiritual one. And there are a lot of people in our culture today that live out of this. It's called the gospel of universalism. And here's what that says. It says, yeah, there's a God, but many, there are many different paths to get to God. And salvation happens when you choose your own pathway and you're sincere and your intentions are right and you live a good, quote, moral life. Your sincerity, your intentions, and your best efforts, God will ultimately say, well done. So you just pick your path. You choose your path. And it doesn't matter if it's Buddhism. It doesn't matter if it's New Ageism. It doesn't matter whether it's Catholicism or whether it's being a Protestant. It doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, worshiping a dog. It doesn't matter what it, whatever it is. You, you name it. If that's your path and you're sincere about it, that, that's all that God's looking for. Listen to me. Number one, all religions are not true. All religions are not the same. And if all religions, if there were many ways to get to God and to find salvation, then God is cruel because there was no need for Jesus to go to the cross. The fact that Jesus went to the cross was a fulfillment of Jesus' words in the garden when he said, if there's any other way, let this cup be removed from me. If universalism was true, God could have said to Jesus, you know what, they can kind of do a whole bunch of different options, so you're good, don't go to the cross. Jesus went to the cross because it was the only way. And Jesus said it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life. And by the way, if you've ever studied comparative religions, you realize all religions are not the same. They're radically different from one another. And sincerity is awesome. I've got some great friends who are sincere believers in other religions. We're friends. We're actually friends. I have friends that are Hindu, and they don't believe in Christianity. And I've got friends uh, who, who really don't even believe in God. They're kind of skeptical and agnostic. They're curious about me. And so we have some interesting conversations. But we can still be friends, and they are radically sincere. But let me tell you something. Sincerity doesn't save you. I can be sincere and ask you, hey, I want to go to Chicago. How should I get there? And if I were to ask you how to get to Chicago, would you say, well, you know what? You can kind of go any way that you want to. Just really be sincere about it. <laughs> no, you would say, well, what you do is you jump on 94 and you go south to 80 and you take that into Chicago and you, you got to definitely go west. If you were to give me directions and I told you, well, you know what? That's really narrow-minded of you. Who are you to tell me that I have to go west if I want to go to Chicago? I want to go to Chicago, but I want to go north. I'm going to take 131 north. Well, that won't get you to Chicago, you bigot. That's not politically correct. You must hate me because you just told me that if I go that way, I'm going the wrong way. No, I love you. I'm trying to tell you you're going the wrong way. Well, I'm going north, and you know what? I'm sincere, and so my good intentions are going to get me to Chicago eventually. No, what's going to happen is you're going to be eating frozen cherries overlooking a cloudy Grand Travers Bay full of art, full of snow, and having to hitchhike a ride on a snowmobile to get back to your car and have a plow get you onto 131 so that you can return home and take a Greyhound to Chicago because we don't trust you to drive. <laughs> Sincerity doesn't get you where you want to go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The power of salvation is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. Recognizing we are whosoever's and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Whosoever. Well, okay, so we're all whoever's. But do we believe in Jesus? Because that's what it says, whoever believes. You know, right now, if you were to do a poll, Rasmussen poll recently just came out across Americans, and over 70% of Americans say they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Numbers have actually dropped over the last few decades, which I actually think is probably a more accurate reflection. Over 70% of Americans say that they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Over 60% believe that the Bible is the Word of God. But here's what's interesting to me, is that we take polls like that and we say that we believe, 
But do our lives really bear that out? Because you see, acknowledging something is not the same as believing something. It's not the same. We can say, well, I acknowledge the existence of Jesus, but that's not the same as actually believing Jesus that produces salvation. Belief, the word belief in the Bible is the same word for faith, and it comes from the Greek word piste. And what it means is to be fully convinced to be radically confident in something. When I just listed off humanism, hedonism, and universalism, here's, here's what I say is, our culture today, when you look at people who live under these different gospels, you can work your way backwards. You can look at their actions. You can look at their time. You can look at their words, their relationships, and you can do the math back and go, oh, I know what you believe. But can people do that with us based on what we say we believe about Jesus. Uh, a, a long time ago, I was in another city and a guy came up to me street witnessing. Anybody ever had somebody like just cold call street witnessing, walk up to you, hand you a track, and it's like, hey, do you know Jesus? Guy gave me a little comic book tract. It said, this is your life. And I'm like, oh, I love this. I wanted to see if he had the goods. I was like, oh, so what do you believe? And he says, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again, that he's coming again, and that you're either saved or you're lost. And I mean, he, 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 bullet points, he was going at it pretty good. He's like, what do you believe? I said, well, I'm a Christian. He says, how do you know? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor. He goes, that doesn't matter. I go, ooh, gold star. <laughs> and I explained to him why I believed I was a Christian. He said this, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence for you to be found guilty in your life? Could they look, could a prosecuting attorney look at your life, look at your bank records, look at your conversations, look at your relationships, look at what you invest your time in, look at the decisions that you make? Is there enough evidence in your life that if they did the math, it would lead back to going, oh yeah, this person's a Christian? I was like, ooh, that's really good. I'm stealing that. Think about that. See, because we can say that we believe something, but sometimes it's just we're merely acknowledging something. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, it's Christmas time. I know, but I got that. But yet live like a practical agnostic. Like live throughout our lives as if Jesus really didn't come. As if Jesus really wasn't the Son of God. As if Jesus really didn't rise from the dead. That's why I get wound up, guys. It's like when, I'm, when we're talking about things like Jesus and the resurrection and the power and the second coming, that's not like golf clap material. That's not like, oh, yeah, that's exciting. No, this is like, he's coming. I mean, it's shocking that God became a child in the Middle East to a 14-year-old Middle Eastern woman. And it was God and fully man in the flesh, and he grew up as the son of God. This stuff should blow our minds. And listen, it should alter our lives. It should alter our lives. It should change the way that we believe. See, if all we do is mentally ascend to something and yet it hasn't sunk in to fully convince us 18 inches can actually determine your, your eternity. The difference between here and here. Our life, the, the ramifications of who Jesus is and, wh and what the Bible says he taught and what he did should radically reorder our lives. It's like, if that's true, then all bets are off. You see, it's not enough to, to say that Jesus was just a good moral teacher what a lot of people say. But C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Jesus is who he said he was, Lord. What do we believe? Because when we come to the issue of belief, Sometimes it's an issue of mentally just saying, okay, uh, I acknowledge that, but I'm not really sure the implications of that. Real belief changes us, but here's what we typically do. A lot of times this happens where 
when we are confronted with the message of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and we realize we're a whosoever and we're being presented with the gospel, here's a lot of times the response that we have to Jesus and the gospel. Number one is some want to dismiss Jesus because if you can dismiss Jesus, you don't have to acknowledge and alter the course of your life based on who Jesus claimed he was. And so we want to dismiss Jesus. That's why magazine covers like this are published on a pretty regular basis where we're in a search for the real Jesus. Jesus, the son of God, maybe not, but maybe he was just a good carpenter, a good moral teacher. Listen, like C.S. Lewis said, if Jesus was just a good man and everybody else got it wrong, the things that Jesus said made him crazy. Like when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Before Abraham was, I am. Destroy this temple, and three days later, I'll raise it back up again. Those are, he, he, somebody asked him, are you the Messiah? He said, I am. Are you God? I am. Those are radical statements, but a lot of people in our society today, listen, even right now, want to dismiss Jesus. Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a good moral teacher. He was a prophet. But if we dismiss Jesus, We'll miss Jesus. Someone to dismiss him? Here's the, here's the one that's probably more common. You ready? We want to customize Jesus. Right now, you can order some really sweet Air Force One Nikes on Amazon, and you can go on there, and you can actually customize them. You can pick out the color of the stripe, the color of the leather. You can have names embroidered on them. It's, I mean, incredible. Perfect Christmas present, if you're looking for one, by the way. I wear a size 12. And so... <laughs> But you can customize all kinds of things. We live in a culture of customization. You, can, you want to go and order a couch? Oh, pick out your fabric. What kind of filling? Do you want the down filling or the super deluxe filling or the memory foam filling? Uh, do you want wood legs? Do you want that? I mean, how, what length do you want? You can get all kinds of things. You go and buy a car, all the options. When I grew up, there was only one option for a car. It was the only one we could afford. It had roll-up windows, no air conditioning, and vinyl seats. And in the summer, you stuck to the seats. Anybody remember that? Air, we had 260 air conditioning. Two windows at 60 miles an hour. That was your air conditioning. <laughs> now everybody customized, like, oh, I need satellite navigation, DVDs. I need to have a refrigerator. I need to have not only heated seats, but cooling seats. I need to have, you can customize your car. But listen, all oh, that's great. Just don't customize Jesus. Because what happens when we customize Jesus in our postmodern, secretistic culture is we take parts away from Jesus. And if you take parts away from Jesus that you are uncomfortable with in order to customize Jesus to fit your life, then you'll miss parts of Jesus. And if you add things to Jesus to make him more like the Jesus you want him to be, you'll end up with a different Jesus. Beware when Jesus agrees with you all the time. See, when we customize Jesus, we might end up with a, a hipster Jesus. Because <laughs> we want a cool Jesus. Jesus who agrees with our politics. Jesus who listens to the same music. Jesus that gets mad at the same people. Jesus who only certain parts of the, of the narrative of what Jesus taught really applies to us. And Jesus agrees with us on the other things. Jesus is my homeboy. See, what we want to do is we want to customize Jesus. And in customizing our Jesus, we might actually end up with, unfortunately, an Americanized Jesus. Can you put the, might end up with, <laughs> with a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus because he's like us. But it doesn't say that Jesus loved America, although he does. So he's, God so loved the do you know that Jesus had dark skin? Do you know that Jesus was Jewish and he was part of a minority that lived in a country that was under military occupation and oppression? Do you know that Jesus was an immigrant? Do you know that Jesus had to run for his life to another nation? Wait a second now, hey, you're messing with my, yeah, no, I'm messing with your American Jesus. Just don't customize them. 
That's what I'm saying. Let Jesus be Jesus and stand back and let the chips fall where they may. I don't care what the gospels say, they are true every single time. I don't get to do like Thomas Jefferson does and go through the gospels and say, I don't like that part and cut it out so that what you're left with is the Jeffersonian gospels where Jesus says the things that you like and you remove the things that you don't like. You wanna know what believing in Jesus is? It means taking him lock, stock, and barrel, which leads us to number three. Some of us want to domesticate Jesus. We don't want Jesus free and wild. We want Jesus meek and mild. We want Jesus who's just nice and sweet, not the Jesus that's confrontational and turns over tables. When we think of Jesus turning over tables, we're oftentimes thinking about Jesus turning somebody else's tables over. What happens when Jesus comes into your house? Is there any tables he might want to turn over? How about in your life? Any tables that maybe Jesus wants to turn over? Jesus doesn't turn over tables in a fit of rage. Jesus turns over tables because of his passion and his zeal for the house. And when God confronts and corrects and convicts in our life, he's not doing it because he's mad and angry and is done with you. He's doing it because he wants to set things in order because he's zealous for you. Because he wants to save you from yourself. How do we respond to the gospel when we recognize we're a whosoever? We don't dismiss Jesus. We don't customize Jesus. We don't domesticate Jesus. What do we do with Jesus? You ready? Believe Jesus. Believe Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to hear I messed up the words (laughs) just to hear Thus says the Lord. Sing it with me. Jesus, Jesus, how I, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, well done. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Believe Jesus. Come on, let's stand up. Would you stand up with me? Father, today, would you help us to believe you? Would you help us to trust you? Would you help us to push back the storms of our greatest fears and would you help us to cast off and to shake off all the impediments all the lies all of our biases prejudices all the things where we try and self justify ourselves and just simply come as a whoever and say Jesus gift of God I believe I believe. I'm a whoever. I can't fix myself, but I believe in you I can have eternal life. In you, everything can be different. I shall not perish, but I will have everlasting life. In both rooms, I just want to ask you to keep your eyes closed for just a moment. Today, you may be here and you've tried. We've tried going to church, that wasn't enough. We've prayed a prayer, that wasn't enough. Tried to improve yourself, but things remain the same. And you wondered, is there anything that can bring peace into my heart? Is there anything that can remove the burden and the weight and the shame of the things I've done and the way I'm living? Is there anything that can assure me that I'm right with God? Today, I want you to hear me. His name is Jesus. 
I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm not talking about signing a piece of paper. I'm talking about you acknowledging that he is the way, the truth, and the life and inviting him to come into your heart. When he comes in, he makes everything new. He brings peace. He brings life. He brings hope. And he brings assurance that we are the children of God. Today, if you're not right with God, today, if you're in this room and you feel so far away, I want you to know that today he stepped into this room for you. And it's a gift that he just is hoping that you will receive. You don't earn it, you just receive it. Today, all over this room, with no one looking around, if you're here and you say, Pastor Lee, today I know that I need to get my life right with God. Today, I need that gift of God's salvation. Today, I believe in Jesus. I don't know how to do it all, but today I believe, and today I want to receive this gift. I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want a new beginning. Pray for me, include me in this prayer. We're gonna pray. I wanna include you in this prayer, but all over this room and at Portage, if that's you right now, I want you to just lift up your hand, say, that's me, pray for me, include me in this prayer. Today, I'm ready to come home and get right with God. Thank you, thank you, come on. I see that hand, yes, yes, yes. Who else? Yes, I see that hand, God bless you. Down here, yes, young man. I see that young lady. All the way in the back, Sarah, I see your hand. Just keep it up, all over the room. Many, God's moving in our midst hands all over the room. This is your moment. Come home. Receive the gift of salvation today. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. I want everyone in this room, I want everyone at Portage to say this prayer with me out loud as a confession to the Lord. Say, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name, and today I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross to pay for my sins, that he rose from the dead to give me eternal life if I would believe. And today I believe. Jesus, come into my heart, sit on the throne, rule and reign just as you are. From this day forward, I turn my back on my past. I turn my back on all other gospels and I choose to live for Jesus. As a child of God, I have a hope and I have a future. Thank you for loving me, God, and sending Jesus to this whosoever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, somebody, you just prayed that prayer. You just translated out of darkness and into light.